Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the years, I've watched many rocket launches and appreciated, uh, you know, the visuals they bring. But I can say for a fact that this particular one is a work of art, or at least it is part of a work of art. It is part of the film Koyana Skatsi, a series of visuals that goes along with the music. And that means there's a lot of people have watched this particular Atlas rocket launch uh, that have no interest in space flight in general. But for rocket fans out there, this one is particularly notable because this is the first launch of the Atlas Centaur. Prior to this, we had various uh, other Atlas upper stages, but the Centaur was going to provide high energy upper stage capabilities. And indeed, Atlas Centaur continued to evolve and still flies today in the form of Atlas V. And Centaur will continue after the end of Atlas in the form of Atlas V on the Vulcan rocket. But they had a few problems to solve before it got that far. Yes, this was a rather spectacular rocket failure. And of course, many people have seen it in the art film version where it's, in my case, I saw it blown up onto a massive film screen with a live orchestra conducted by Philip Glass. And it was a pretty impressive experience. And look, I totally get that the music of Philip Glass is not for everyone. My tastes in music are all over the place. But I think that we as an audience can all get together and agree that rockets exploding are some of the most spectacular things to witness. In this case, not only did we get the aerodynamic breakup and subsequent fireball formed by the, the rocket disintegrating, the cameras, the tracking cameras, were able to find specific pieces of debris and follow them down. Can you guess what this is yet? Well, uh, if we get closer, as it gets closer over time, it becomes more and more obvious that this is a an engine from the Atlas. And I think very specifically, it is the center engine because you can see that it has the boat tail that the center sustainer engine had. Remember, the original Atlas is kind of unique among rocket designs because it starts out with three engines and then drops two of the engines without dropping any fuel tanks. This was because in the early days, they weren't sure about being able to light the engines in flight. So they knew if they lit the engines on the ground and then dropped them, they could get around that particular problem. You'll notice that the R7 that the Soyuz is derived from has a similar strategy of lighting its engines on the ground and then peeling off those four boosters right at the end. So this happened in 1962. The Atlas had, of course, started out as America's first intercontinental ballistic missile designed to carry warheads. But it very quickly turned into a viable space launch vehicle. Initially, you had things like Atlas Able, but Atlas Agena had become the sort of uh, top rate Atlas. It had become sufficiently reliable that they knew that they could put people on it, and it was used for the Mercury program. And of course, it carried John Glenn into orbit, making him the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. Indeed, there was a lot of concern because this happened just a few weeks before Scott Carpenter was supposed to fly on a Mercury Atlas. However, the engineers were quickly able to ascertain that the problem lay not with the booster, but with the Centaur upper stage, and so Scott Carpenter was cleared to fly. If you watch the failure in slow motion, you see the initial failure starts up at the top of the Centaur near the fairing. There's a white cloud of cryogenic propellants as the tanks fail, and then a combination of debris and aerodynamic forces cause the main tank to fail and the entire rocket disintegrates. One thing that many people see when watching this film is this umbilical hose which remained attached after departure. Some people attribute the failure to this, but this was totally unrelated. Sure, they didn't want to bring that hose with them, but it wasn't what ultimately caused the failure. We actually have engineering footage from many, many angles showing all this working. You can see the Vernier engine at the top in the middle there and the three engines lighting down below. And yeah, you can see that umbilical there connected just below that, uh, that Vernier where it's firing. And it continues upwards with the rocket as it leaves the pad. Again, this didn't cause the failure. It's just a cool thing to see. No, the problem all lay with the new Centaur upper stage. So Centaur was America's first experience with hydrogen fueled uh, systems. It was designed to be an upper stage, so it had to be as light as possible. So it used stainless steel tanks, which were balloon stabilized, removing a lot of the internal ribbing and stuff so that it would just hold its shape by the gas pressure inside. It had two first generation uh, 
RL10 engines. These are expander cycle engines which are very efficient and versions of them still fly today. Most of the tank was liquid hydrogen, though the liquid oxygen tank was down below. They, it also included attitude control systems and uh, propellant settling thrusters so that they would be able to relight the stage in flight. Because liquid hydrogen was so low density, the Centaur was much wider and larger than the Agena, so the Atlas got rid of its sloped, uh, tapered form and became a straight-up rocket, basically like a much more modern uh, Atlas. And this basic recipe for the Atlas would be the one that persisted going forwards. The Atlas II would fly right up until uh, 2004 with basically some engine upgrades, tank stretches, and the ability to strap on some uh, external solid rocket motors. Because they were working with liquid hydrogen, they really needed to insulate that second stage tank, but they didn't want to carry the insulation to pit space. So they had these foam panels which were attached around the outside, and these were designed to be separated during the staging process so that the upper stage could continue to space without being carrying along all this excess insulation foam. So these panels would be exposed to aerodynamic forces during ascent and they had to test that to make sure it worked. Here's a case where they put it in a supersonic wind tunnel and have them exposed to the airflow to make sure that they are structurally sound, they don't flap, they don't uh, have any other changes which might affect their ability to work. After a few months of studying the relevant data, the accident investigation team came to the conclusion that these panels had likely failed in some way and that they had started allowing in high pressure energetic air which was intera would interact with the tank, heat up the hydrogen faster than the bleed valve could handle, resulting in the hydrogen tank failing due to overpressure. And so that's what they told Congress, that was the official report. There was some people who wanted to cancel Atlas Centaur, arguing that Saturn I could do all the missions that Atlas Centaur was going to do. But it, you know, Saturn I was a lot more expensive, and Saturn V was really relying on the hydrogen technology that was being tested and developed on Centaur. So Atlas Centaur survived. And so the next few launches would be successful. The fifth launch was a failure, but that was a booster problem. Uh, eventually, it was used to launch the surveyor probes to the moon in uh, four years after that initial launch. And then apparently five years after the Atlas Centaur 1 failure, some engineers realized that it wasn't the foam panels that had caused the problem. And now here's where the details get a little vague. I've read a few things here and there, but I haven't found a definitive report. But it appears the problem was actually related to the fairings and the way that they were attached to the Centaur upper stage structurally. Most of the structural attachments to the stage were made by metal rings, which were tightened around it under pressure, and these could then be released. Now, the fairings themselves would have little gas thrusters that would push them away. But... It appears that in some cases, the metal rings weren't tight enough and the stainless steel would contract at a different rate than the metal rings that were being used to secure things because of this differential expansion. And that presumably means that the rings that were being used to secure the fairing became less tightly attached as the tank shrank faster. Now, I don't know this for sure, but it seems like the logical conclusion based on what I read. So that would mean that as the aerodynamic pressures built up, the ring might have slipped, damaged the tank, caused a pressure release, and ultimately caused the failure of the entire tank and the rocket. And that's why we have this footage. And yeah, ultimately ends up accompanying a Philip Glass piece. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.